Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for coming to uh, uh, Yale uh, Interventional Radiology Grand Round. Uh, the, today, we have a Dr. Steve Solomon. This is a great, great uh, pleasure, and uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have him as our Grand Round uh, speaker uh, the, uh, today. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, for those of us who are in interventional radiology, he really doesn't need an introduction, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, perhaps uh, the uh, quick uh, story uh, uh, that the, uh, the, you know, when he was young, you know, he had to go to uh, our neighbor in Boston, uh, Harvard College, uh, for uh, his undergrad, but then he came to his uh, census and came to Yale uh, for medical school where he received uh, MD, so this is sort of a homecoming for him today. And then he finished his internship here uh, at the Yale as well. Uh, and then I went to uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins for uh, the uh, residency. Uh, after going through uh, investigator track uh, facultyship at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, he uh, finished uh, the Interventional Radiology Fellowship at the uh, Cornell and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, where he stayed as a faculty, and uh, now he's a professor uh, at uh, Cornell and uh, the uh, chief of interventional radiology at the uh, MSKCC. Locally, uh, I think uh, he single-handedly built the uh, uh, interventional radiology and the image-guided uh, medicine uh, uh, at the MSKCC, which now uh, I think is a formidable challenger to us uh, uh, nearby. Uh, but nationally and internationally, he is a well, well recognized uh, the uh, leader, uh, leading authority in interventional oncology, particularly in uh, lung cancer. So, uh, in the in light of a uh, precision medicine, personalized medicine, uh, I ask uh, Steve uh, to discuss uh, the, uh, the role of uh, interventional radiology in the uh, precision medicine. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Well, thank you all for having me. It's really an honor and it's a great homecoming for me. As, as Kevin said, coming back to Yale, I mean, this is where it all started for me personally. Uh, and, and I just said hello to Jeff Pollack, who wrote my letter of recommendation for residency. Uh, and helped inspire me to become an interventional radiologist along with Bob White and several others uh, here. So it, it really is a, a great thing to come back home, let's say. And uh, th so thank you for inviting me. Um, today, when I was talking to Kevin about what topic I should talk about, you know, in interventional oncology, there are a lot of, let's say, very exciting areas of, in, uh, of ablation or uh, uh, tastes, and uh, those are all possible topics to talk about. And I chose something that most of us in interventional oncology would say, well, ha, 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 but you know, biopsy. Um, and the reason, however, I chose it was because in a lot of ways, it's the foundation of what we do in interventional oncology. And to be an interventional oncologist, it starts with the biopsy. And it's where you get the tissue. It's your value added among all the medical oncologists. It's what they, they find most important what we do. And so remember, what they're thinking is really going to be important on, on how you pra your practice develops. So we try to train our, our fellows to be oncologists and then proceduralists, interventional oncologists. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about oncology and how it plays in, and biopsy will be our basis here. So precision medicine, uh, the role of interventional radiology. And I think it's hard to turn the pages of um, uh, the lay press and talk about medicine without hearing about precision medicine. And precision medicine is the hottest thing, and it's about how we've discovered how the genetics of one cancer is di is, could be different than the genetics of another cancer. And that genetic changes dictates what drug therapy you're going to get. Patient A here uh, may have lung cancer, patient B may have lung cancer, but their genetic mutations are different and therefore their drugs are different. And now we're already at that point where you can go to your pharmacy and say, you know, pretty much here's my sequence and I'll take the different drug that you need. This is such a hot topic that at the State of the Union address in this year, 2016, Obama, President Obama, uh, uh, offered or requested a billion dollars to further fund precision medicine in his cancer moonshot uh, program, which is very exciting and it just again reiterates how important this field really is. So how does this play into interventional radiology? Okay, so precision medicine and interventional radiology, we're gonna talk about biopsies and its importance. We're going to talk about how the genetics of a patient can predict whether they respond to taste or they respond to an ablation. And we're going to then tell how the personalized 
cancer that that person has can dictate a vaccin vaccination program. So let, let's talk a little bit about this. We've known for a long time, and I'm going to focus on lung cancer for a few reasons. One is it's a, a particular interest, as Kevin told, me, told you, um, to me. But uh, the other thing about lung cancer is, in many ways, it has become the lead, the lead front for this concept of precision medicine. And we've made tremendous strides in patient survival uh, with the new precision medicine. And so for a long time, we've known that patients who have adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinoma and large cell carcinoma, they respond differently to many of the more traditional chemotherapies that exist. And we know that if you have adenocarcinoma, large cell, these are the drugs that you would take, whereas if you had squamous cell, these are. But in the, only in the recent, let's say, 15 years, uh, we've discovered that there, we can go further. We can get to the era of targeted therapy. So for example, gefitinib is a drug that targets EGFR mutations. And when initially it was given to patients with lung cancer, they gave it to all lung cancer patients. And they found that only a subset of those lung cancer patients responded. And sure enough, these are the ones that had the EGFR mutation that, uh, that, we were, that led to the response to gefitinib. So it wasn't that you had lung cancer, it was that you had a lung cancer with a specific EGFR mutation, you are going to respond to erlotinib or gefitinib. And, and that became sort of the opening to this field of precision medicine. And the genetics really do matter. So we have discovered now that adenocarcinoma in the lung has many different mutations. And depending on which of these mutations you have, we have different drugs that we can give these patients that will lead to a response. And so getting enough tissue to be able to sequence the tissue and discover what genetic mutations you have is critical. And this is just a distribution of the different types of mutations that a lung cancer and adenocarcinoma might have, such as KRAS, EGFR, ALK mutation. Uh, and et cetera. And you can see how we're getting to the point where we can actually sequence a cancer and tell you what you have. And as I said, there are many new drugs that are approved, that are in clinical trials, and are developed for resistance. And, and these are the things that we're going to have to learn, even as an interventional radiologist, not being a medical oncologist. But if you want to practice in this area, you need to be an oncologist to know what these drugs are. These drugs make a difference. Survival outcomes are different whether you have a driver mutation or you don't have a driver mutation, meaning a driver mutation, meaning you have one of those EGFR mutations, you will have a better response than if you don't. And it goes beyond just medical oncologists. So we just talked about survival for patients who have EGFR mutations, but what about in surgery? And this is a, a study that looked at surgical patients with lung cancer. Patients with surgery did worse if they had a KRAS mutation. They did better if they had an EGFR mutation. So the mutation you have will also impact your surgery. And in research that we've been doing, we've also identified that in lung ablation, uh, and this is work, again, a lot of this work is through the help of my co colleagues, Itai Ziv and Jeremy Durek, but we found that if you have a KRAS mutation, your results from lung ablation are worse than if you had no mutation or EGFR mutation. So I've just told you how exciting the field of precision medicine is and how, what a great impact it's having on lung cancer, but it, well, we haven't gotten to the point of completely curing patients. And this is the sobering thought that notwithstanding these drugs that are active, actually making people live longer, they eventually develop mutations. And this is a great example um, that we have of a patient who has metastatic lung cancer. They're on erlotinib, one of the EGFR mutant uh, uh, drugs, and they have stable disease for many years. But then a little clone develops a second mutation that develops resistance, and all of a sudden now they have a, a new resistance out there. What's interesting for us who practice local regional cancer therapy, and this is somewhat of an aside, is that although this patient has metastatic disease throughout their body, they have this one focus that has gotten resistant to the drug we're giving them. So the thought process is, can we treat this as a local disease, a local problem? If I can ablate this small uh, lung uh, mutation here, can the patient continue on their erlotinib therapy that has stabilized the disease throughout the body? And that's the thought. We actually have some publications showing that this actually indeed seems to be the, the result, that you can actually 
take a person who's starting to develop resistance and, and knock out the area that's resistant and allow them to continue on, continue on their drug therapy and they will do better. So we talked about resistance just now. So resistance to, for example, this EGFR mutation has been discovered through another mutation that's called the T790M mutation. So in other words, I'm giving you erlotinib, you're doing great because you have this EGFR mutation, and then all of a sudden you develop a second mutation called T790M, and now that erlotinib doesn't work anymore. So uh, we have to develop new drugs, and here's just the graph showing you again that if you have this T790M mutation, you're not, you're, you're, you're going to, if you don't, if you have the particular mutation, you're going to do worse. And what this, these arrows back and forth are saying is that the biopsy is critical. You do the biopsy, you find out that they have the EGFR mutation, then, you ha then they resist and they develop more tumor, you do the biopsy again, you find that they have this T790M mutation, and so the biopsy is critical, and that's why the oncologists are keep coming and knocking on our door saying, more tissue, this is really important. So they think it's really important, we need to really think it's important too. So are our biopsies adequate? And this is a very interesting question. Um, uh, the concept of an adequate biopsy has changed radically because of this whole uh, ev revolution of precision medicine. 20 years ago, an adequate biopsy meant you had a few cells that were able to say, hey, this is cancer, so you would, you would be adequate. But we're changing. We're no longer about morphologic cells of cancer. We need to have enough cells to do the genetic testing. So, a biopsy today, in 2016, that doesn't have enough material to do genetic testing is inadequate. There may be enough there to say, you know what, you have lung adenocarcinoma, but if you don't have lung adenocarcinoma and you have enough material to do genetic testing, it's insufficient. We, we've, what, what, hap, what, what was very interesting was early on in this whole revolution, the oncologists would say, uh, they would say, well, we need, you know, five nanograms of DNA to test for genetics. And all of us in IR would say, okay, well, what is five nanograms? You know, I'm standing here with a patient, I have a needle, what, uh, five, how do I know what I have? So we did a, a study looking at 18 gauge needles and also 20 gauge needles and, and trying to figure out how much DNA and RNA, and this has somewhat been able to, to help us gu guide how much material. I, if, you, if you get some, some really good cores out of a patient, you have enough material to do genetics testing because they've gotten better at their testing and their requirements have gotten lower. And you can actually even do genetic testing on FNA samples as well. So are our biopsies adequate or functional? There are several uh, publications that have looked at when you do a core needle biopsy or an FNA, can you tell the genetics? or Early on, the thought was, oh, I need to take out the whole cancer to be able to do this specimen. Well, luck, you know, lucky for us and who do needle biopsies, we actually can get enough material from a needle biopsy to do genetic testing, and that actually is great for us, and it's great for the patients who have less invasive procedures. But are we doing a good enough job? Um, are our samples enough for the molecular testing? And unfortunately, many of our samples have not been enough for genetic testing. Yes, as I said, they can tell you you have lung adenocarcinoma, but unfortunately we don't know if we have enough material, and that's incredibly frustrating. For example, imagine you're a patient and you come in for this biopsy to get the genetic testing, and uh, that genetic testing generally may take three weeks or four weeks to get those results back. So you go in, you get your biopsy, now you wait four weeks and you go to the doctor's office and they say, hey, uh, I don't have enough genetic material. That's a terrible thing for a patient psychologically and have to go over it again. So we need to do a better job. And this disturbing lay press article got out in, uh, in early January of this year um, that basically was very condemning of us who do needle biopsies and basically saying that, uh, they're, that, they're, that we're the problem, that, that unfortunately this, the, the, whole, the whole field of precision medicine is falling on our shoulders and we're not doing a good enough job. Uh, we need to do, make sure that we get enough material. And this also stems from uh, these, this is, for example, the Lung Adenocarcinoma uh, Mutation Consortium. When they looked at their data, they found that about 25 to 35% of cases uh, from needle biopsy were inadequate for the genetic testing. 
we need to do a better job. And, and, and better job is not that hard for us to do. It just, maybe it means an extra sample, and that's all it is. Um, and while you're there and your needle's there, and you're, you just take an extra sample. Um, the other interesting topic that comes up when you talk about biopsy in this era of genetic uh, 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 testing is, as I said before, um, that, that mass in the lung that I showed a picture of, and I think I have the picture again coming up, um, part of the t tumor may have some genetic profile and another part of the tumor may have another genetic profile. And so one of the concerns people have voiced is, well, you know, if you biopsy, are you sample, is the sample that you got not representative of the whole thing? And that's an active a field of active eva evaluation. And uh, we're still learning about that because, I mean, certainly in a small lesion, you would think that you get all the genetics, but maybe in a, in a large lesion, there's different pockets here and there. And that's something that we have to uh, be aware of. And this is um, an interesting, uh, uh, these are one of these evolutionary trees where what happens is everybody, start, like in a, it, this is within a cancer, everybody starts with one, let's say, EGFR mutation, and then some cells add extra mutations this way, and they evolve this way, and so you have many pathways. All of them seem to have the, a general branch in the beginning, which hopefully is enough for targeting. But th this is actually a field that, that really is gonna be exciting as we start to biopsy different areas. We use pet guidance, perhaps, to si decide where to biopsy. So I, I, I hope so far we've talked about oncology, we've talked about how you need to understand the precision medicine field to be a good interventional radiologist, interventional oncologist. But as I was alluding to earlier, I, in many ways, I call the biopsy the gateway drug for oncologists. They're so excited to get the material from us uh, that they keep asking for more stuff. They keep, if, the more you can satisfy them with these biopsies and the tissue for their studies, the more happy they are. And the truth is, the better your relationship is, the better likelihood you are part of that oncology team and certainly can talk about your other procedures that may be more interesting to you. Our lung biopsy uh, uh, um, procedure volume has continued to skyrocket, um, where we're doing probably 1,500 or so biopsies uh, a year of, of lung biopsies. And, and I call it the gateway drug because, as I said, to the oncologists, the, this is critical to any phase one trial that they're doing. It's critical part of their patient care because genetics are really important today. And it, it besides, it provides insight into the mechanism uh, before and after therapy. So the practical questions that need to be answered uh, when you're talking about uh, doing a biopsy is, how much material do I need? I told you the answer is always more. It's always a lot. Um, is the target accessible? And that's where us, we as radiologists have to think. Can I get there? Is it possible? What imaging modality should I use? Is it ultrasound, CT, MRI, PET, et cetera? Is the quantity of tissue needed possible? And is it safe? And for us, we've developed uh, some small teams that are multidisciplinary to talk about biopsy. That team involves medical oncologists who come in with their list of patients and we review with the diagnostic radiologist and nuclear physician and a pathologist and our interventional radiologist to develop and implement and execute a biopsy plan. So we're taking it seriously as to where we should biopsy. Many of these patients have multiple lesions throughout the body. The oncologist doesn't know which lesion you should go after because some are big, some are small, some are safe, some are not. You have to play an active role. And so here you see I, they identify, medical oncologists can identify patients, the diagnostic radiologist can review the possible sites, the interventional radiologist can triage these targets and determine ease of, or, of obtaining sufficient tissue, and the pathologist can do talk about yield. And also this is a feedback, because then we come back another week and say, hey, this one worked, this one didn't, why didn't it work? Well, this was too small. You know, th this is important. And so these are, for example, how you have to look at these targets. A medical oncologist may say, hey, you know, here, here's an interesting one for you. Well, you might say, okay, that's a little tricky, or here, this is a, a small bone thing, or this one is difficult to get at. And so these are kind of examples that we, we review. And we also have to triage based on the imaging appearance. So we know that the likelihood of us getting a DNA sample for, uh, for, for the pathologist with a sclerotic bone is low, lower than our other tissue. So 
you know, if you see this, you're gonna have to tell your colleagues that it's gonna be hard to get a good sample. Maybe there's something else in the body that would be a better site. Is there a soft tissue lesion? Is there a lytic lesion? We can do better with the lytic lesion. Um, or is there even a ground glass kind of bony lesion? Uh, but the worst is always these sclerotic lesions. And, and this example of triage and input that we provide is really important. This is an example from one of our breast oncologists who initially thought, you know, this would be a good target for us. We, at the same time, we looked at the scans. We saw that this is a, even though it might be mediastinal, it was a much easier and, and better target than this little thing here. We really can provide great input to these people. We use advanced imaging guidance, so a lot of our biopsies we might do in bi an MR scanner or even in a PET scanner. We have a, we're very fortunate to have a PET scanner to do our procedures. Uh, this, this has been a great thing. And you know, here's one example where you can't see where the lesion is, but with the PET, it was very easy. We put the needle in, we can do the biopsy. And this is our uh, PET room, which is simply a PET CT where we put monitors in the room to be able to see where, the, you know, to do the case. Uh, anesthesia boom and everything else that we need. <clears throat> and these are just a couple examples, uh, only visible with contrast. Here's the case during the procedure. We didn't really see it well with the ultrasound. We, you could give contrast, uh, but we again did the PET scan. Uh, let's see. So here's another lesion in the spleen, difficult to see without contrast. We did it with contrast, uh, with, with uh, PET, sorry. And what's also interesting is there's more and more uh, molecular, uh, new molecular tracers. And this is one example of a PSMA PET scan using zirconium as the uh, isotope. And we were able to use that as a PET guided uh, targeted biopsy. So very exciting in terms of, so there's, even though we've talked all about the, the, the oncologist perspective, I think there's a lot of exciting things we can talk about from an interventional perspective as well. And I showed you this case earlier and told you how important, you know, the imaging is to decide which part of the lesion I need to biopsy or even ablate. Now, how do we get good results in terms of our uh, biopsy results? For us, we have in-room in cytology or, or pathology assessment. And, and I don't know, each hospital seems to practice a little bit differently. In our hospital, we have um, uh, cytotechnologists and telepathology that help us uh, decide whether the specimen is, en is enough. That way, the patient doesn't leave the room without us sort of having a green light that you got enough. Um, and there are different ways that people do this. So if you're doing an FNA, you might put a, a drop on a, on a slide and do a smear and, and look at that. If you're doing a core biopsy, what we've had in the past, what we've done is we've rolled the core on the, on the slide in this kind of core biopsy. We call this a touch prep where we roll it on the slide and then we look at the, the slide and some of the cells come off and you know you, you have enough material. Um, what we found is, although I told you that the, nationally, you were hearing about 30, 25% inadequate molecular specimens. At, at Sloan, with this technique of having the pathologist review while the patient's on the table, this impact is the uh, genetic sequencing at Sloan. Uh, we, we have very few failures. We're probably in the, let's say, 85 to 95% success rate on our molecular testing, which is uh, absolutely uh, top notch. Now we do know that when we roll the sample on the slide, that sometimes we've rolled it so much that we've lost all the material on that touch prep. And we, and so this is the, the initial touch prep of adequacy. Yeah, you have this cancer, but then when they process the specimen, there are no more cancer cells. There's some cancer cells that stick to the slide so much that you lose them all. So it's very important that you're not so vigorous in terms of how much you roll that, that thing on the slide. Um, to make sure you can, you know, have some material for, for them to ultimately process. So in, we, we scratched our heads and we said, hmm, how can we do assessment in a better way? And uh, so this is one of our techniques that we've been working on, and that is a device to do spectroscopy where we analyze the uh, sample in the room in under a minute with light analysis and we can take the spectra from the sample in the core biopsy needle and geographically even tell us whether or not there's uh, cancer in that sp specimen. And this is work that's still going on in our lab. 
uh, with uh, uh, Jeremy Durek has uh, been leading this with our group and we've taken samples and we've shown that we can be 90% successful in terms of our uh, ability to tell you that you have cancer or not. And maybe one day in the future, we won't need to call pathologists down to the, uh, to the IR suite or telepathology. We can do this initial evaluation with this machine. What was even more shocking actually in our ability to do this was I didn't, I, thought we, I didn't think we were gonna get this level, but we could actually subtype the cancer based on the light reflection uh, of the specimen, which is unbelievable. Because even in, under gross inspection or microscopic inspection, the pathologists are challenged by this type of subtyping. Um, and so we can not only do it, as I said, uh, by, by the light, but we can, we can also do it geographically. So we can tell what part of the core has the cancer in it. And another area that we've been uh, investigating is, you know, especially when we do patients in our PET scanner, is can we see if the, the sample that comes out of the patient is actually uh, hot as an indicator that we hit the target. Uh, and indeed we can by doing an autoradiograph in the room to tell us that we have the adequate specimen. And this is also work that's, uh, that's in, in progress. So, so far, I've talked about oncologists and their desire for precision medicine and the whole, uh, how important it is. I've talked about biopsies and how we as a field play a critical role here. We may not realize it, but it's really important. We need to do a better job and some of the techniques and research that we're doing to do a better job. The next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how precision medicine can predict response to things that we do and are, are more excited about, like ablations and catheter-directed therapy. And so we know that our survival after lung ablation uh, is excellent. And uh, that's, you know, there's a recent study in cancer that came out from Multicenter looking at survival in, in after lung ablation. However, the, the, the elephant in the room is that while survival has been good, our recurrence rates have not, you know, been, we, we have too high a recurrence rate. And so we have to think about that. How can we do a better job uh, of doing this. I mean, we map the ablation zone, we keep temperatures up, we keep tumor sizes down, we use generous margins, but something is not, not going as well as we'd like. And so we're in our group thinking very much about the biology. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we have a bunch of uh, people in our, our lab now thinking about biology and the environment that cancer lives in and how that impacts our procedures like ablation. And as I told you before, the KRAS mutation has an impact in surgery and medical oncology and even in lung ablation. And this is the work that I said Itai Ziv has been looking at. If you look at, you know, sure, the margin that you get is important uh, for the ablation. The size of the tumor is, is, is important. But the presence of KRAS is, seems to be the most important p-value of all the things. If you have wild type or KRAS, KRAS is a bad predictor. And you can see here our, our local recurrence rate if you had KRAS uh, versus uh, not KRAS. On the other hand, if you had EGFR, the, the recurrence rate really didn't make that much difference. So the KRAS seems to make an impact. And we need to understand the biology of why KRAS is, is making an impact on our ablations. And even when they look good, a KRAS mutation seems to have come back. We've also studied the histology, and, and, and this is all part of the same sort of efforts to understand biology and the impact on ablation. Uh, we've looked at histology. So in lung cancer, there's micropapillary, there's solid, there's papillary, lipidic, and uh, acinar. And it turns out that micropapillary is the bad guy. And uh, that has been shown in the surgical literature, it's been shown uh, in, in radiation literature, and it's also being shown here after lung ablation, where we see if we have micropapillary in our solid, uh, we have a, a bad outcome here compared to the non-micropapillary or solid. And, and some, you know, so you, can, you might scratch your head and say, well, why should a histology really impact what's going on, and, and what, how does that mechanistically work? Um, I, I found this article kind of interesting, and it, it basically talks about how in, in the radiation oncologist discovered that the margin of, the, they looked at the, uh, the specimen, they said, if I go out five millimeters from the specimen, are there cancer cells? Uh, if I go out 10 millimeters, are there cancer cells? Well, it turns out, depending on the type of cancer you have, the cancer cells are spread out further or closer. 
And so I think the histology can be an impact in terms of where the margins have to be. One type of cancer, you might take tighter margins. Another one, you might need larger margins because the cancer has spread out further uh, through, the, through the bronchi, for example. And now I couldn't, I couldn't come here and just talk about lung cancer with Jeff, who loves uh, tastes. And uh, I have to show some catheter-directed liver therapy, Jeff. So this is a, this is, this is a gift to you, OK? So, um, um, we, we in our group have also looked at precision medicine in terms of other procedures besides lung ablation. And one of them is the area of looking at the impact of genetics on, uh, on liver-directed therapy. And this is one case uh, example. Um, it was a melanoma patient who in 2010 presented to our group um, and then in 2011 had an embolization and had a, a very good response. And we were all patting ourselves on the back. But then in 2012, had recurrence and, uh, and then had a second embolization and didn't do it well afterwards. And, the, you know, what, what, so what is going on here? Why is it coming back? Why is it having different responses depending on the treatment? And there could be a lot of factors, obviously, I mean, in terms of different aspects. But we, we focus on the genetics. So uh, we, you know, we, we do our best. We find vessels. We do super small beads. We do stasis. Um, but, but somehow we're still having this problem. And, and the goal here in this work is to identify patients that may benefit, maybe expand the role of embolization, exclude patients who do not benefit or limit their toxicity and improve the triage, and, pr and figure out uh, adjuvants that can help them uh, do better. So Itai Ziv is a, uh, has a computational biology background, and so he's able to do very sophisticated data analysis in his mathematics and find responders and non-responders. And then he looks at the genetic profiles of all the genetic uh, spe uh, specimens, and then he does a very sophisticated calculations and lines it up finds a dividing line that can separate these two responders and non-responders, and even identifies some responders, like this very interesting case, who was a responder and then became a non-responder. And he became a non-responder, and he moved from blue to red because his genetics changed. He developed a gene that then made him a non-responder. Using this plane that he discovered, uh, he's able to have an accuracy in predicting who's going to be a good responder and a bad responder on the genetics and have a pretty good response, a, a good uh, predictor. So he's able to predict, based on your genetics, whether you will respond or not to uh, uh, embolization procedure. Um, and so these handful of genes, he took the top three genes, and here they are, um, for uh, uh, for response to embolization. And this, of course, is bland embolization. Um, what's really interesting about this is, so he, he does these mathematical calculations, and it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, he's not thinking, okay, which genes or whatever. It's just what falls out when you do the math. And all of a sudden, he finds out that these three are the most, uh, the strongest correlates to good response or a bad response. And what's interesting about them is that they do have an impact on the hypoxia and the ischemic pathway. And this, this is kind of makes some intuitive sense to us because we're doing a bland embolization and it's a ischemic process. And maybe these guys here are predictors. And they, they, fo they focus on the Wnt pathway, uh, the Wnt beta catenin pathway. And we find that uh, with mutations in the beta catenin, which is one of the, the this one over here, uh, it doesn't bind as much. It increases uh, beta catenin in the cell, and we get increased transcription factor. And that perhaps is a way, a, a part of the mechanism. The other two that we talked about are NCOR1 and MEN1, and both, again, bind to hypoxia inducible factor and play a role in hypoxia and its predictive value. So we're, we're scratching our heads, we're thinking about this, and this is a, a great advance to help us figure this out. We also look at our Y90 radioembolization cases. And you know, we know that sometimes we get a good response. And you know, here's a right lobe that was treated and had a very good response. Um, and so who, again, responds and who doesn't respond? Part of the work he's been doing has been looking at the genetics again and identified that the, the PIK3CA gene, which uh, it seems to be uh, the one that, that pre helps predict the most. You see the responders, green responders. Uh, to, to who's going to respond. And here's an example of somebody who has a PIK3CA three, uh, three gene, uh, and all of a sudden they have a good response. In contrast, the KRAS patients, again, I think I moved this slide by accident, but the KRAS patients uh, 
a, not a good response. And you can see on this graph here, you know, that this is a based on size criteria, they have a decrease in size if you have the PIK3CA gene, you didn't have such a response with, without with the KRAS. So I think that in the future, as we go forward, uh, we will be looking at genetics in terms of predicting which of our patients we can better select, who will respond to ablation, who will respond to uh, um, uh, taste, bland embo or Y90. And I know, Kevin, you, you've done some of this work as well in, in the past. <clears throat> so last topic I'll talk about is how we get with cancer, precision medicine, and personalized cancer vaccines. And one of the things that we started thinking about a long time ago was that we are able to create, uh, uh, can we create an immune response? This is a, a focal area of ablation. Um, we know that as soon as we do the ablation, it's a wound, it's an injury. The immune cells come in to, 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 to uh, treat and, and resolve this ablation zone. And if we get all these lymphocytes here, how come we can't generate a response that goes throughout the body? Um, and why can't we create a memory response? Unlike uh, 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 in surgery, they take out the tumor, but we leave in all the antigens of the cancer. We create a, a wound, the, the immune cells come there. Maybe we can create a, a generalized response. So in work that we've done, we, we've created a mouse model that has cancer uh, metastases and we've ablated them. And we've given a, a drug that helps stimulate the immune response. And in this particular case, the, it was a drug with cyclophosphamide. We've done it with ipimilimab, and we've done it with um, other uh, anti-PD-1 drugs. But we found here that if we did cryo plus cyclophosphamide, these mice survived. If you just did surgery or cryo alone, they didn't. Um, and then when we, what we also did was we re-challenged these mice by giving them more cancer. And the mice that had the cryo or the cyclophosphamide, they lived. So they had a memory uh, the immune cells could remember the cancer and fight it off. We could transfer those lymphocytes to other mice, and depending on how many of the lymphocytes we transferred, the better survival was possible. So these are mice that could have a memory to cancer. They could, they could transfer to other mice, and so we're able to create a memory response against cancer with immunology. We've transferred this kind of thought process to patients now, and we have finished a, a study looking at breast cryoablation, uh, in, in women uh, who were about to, uh, a, a month later, go on to have a uh, mastectomy. So we would have the specimen to look at. We gave them ipimilimab, which is one of the um, uh, immunotherapy drugs. And we were able to find that patients who had this had T cell response that were, that were um, specific in T cell clones in the breast cancer after the cryoablation. And we had, three, we had three groups. There was the cryo alone, the IPI drug alone, or the cryo plus IPI. And the cryo plus IPI drug, uh, group had the most of these, focal, these specific clones. And so it shows us promising results. We're, we're moving forward on additional studies looking at combinations of IPI and NEVO, which is the anti-PD-1 drug, and seeing if we can get a further response in these patients, and we'll be looking at metastatic disease. So I think that whether it's taste and you're creating an immune response, whether it's ablation, you create an immune response, the ability to have person, people with cancer that specific antigens are focused on their own antigens, their own cancer, and creating an immune response around that to fight cancer throughout the body is an extremely exciting area for us in interventional oncology. So I'll conclude here and, and stop and just say that precision medicine is one of the hottest areas in medicine today, and interventional oncologists are at the center of the precision medicine revolution through the tissue acquisition of biopsy. Biopsies are considered high value to your referring teams, and so you should recognize that. The genetics can help us ourselves and predict outcomes of our ablation and embolization procedures. And finally, that the immunotherapy, the personalized vaccination against your individual cancer is one of the exciting areas for immuno interventional oncology to grow into the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.